thank you for having me again. Uh, just a few short months ago, um, all for having me. Um, when you're locked, us archivists, ar archival researchers, when you give us the chance to talk, we like to talk because we've been locked in the archive for so long, right? We <laughs> <laughs> want to talk to somebody. So thank you, Little Net, for all of these opportunities to uh, share all of those uh, months reading microfilm and all of that. <clears throat> Today's presentation is an entire semester class in two hours. So, yeah, so you heard the comment about the detail and the depth. Um, but for me, there's no other way to talk about the Mahale but to get at the detail. Because it's the detail, it's the how, not the what. Private property, yes. But the how of a transition to private property is the thing that's particular to this place. And that's what, what is articulated in the title. Western property law is assimilation into Hawaiian property. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so today, whatever you thought about the mahele, I ask you to suspend. Yeah. Um, today, I'm going to drop a bomb. This is not a drill. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, earlier today at Windward Community College at 9 a.m. and I literally had to talk a half hour after I thought I wasn't going to see my son again. So it was one of those. So I had to make a joke. I had to make a joke. <laughs> but this part's not a joke. Yeah, taking ownership of ownership. Um, one of the things I commonly hear when Hawaiians talk about land is Hawaiians didn't own land. And that's what I'm riffing off of in this title, taking ownership of ownership. Because if we didn't own land, we're giving that whole thing away. Yeah. My contention is we didn't own land, and then in 1848 we did. Because the Mahele was inspired by our king. Yeah. Not something that was handed to us in 1848 by another culture, by another people, but something the king saw we got to make a change, we got to make an adaptation, he made that change. Yeah? And for me, that's the part we got to take ownership of. Because if not, we give away everything that was preserved by law. And everything today regarding to Hawaiian land that we're fighting for was preserved in the Hawaiian Kingdom era. The Manao was totally different. Yeah? So the old narrative, so to speak, is that the Mahele was the beginning of the end. My contention, the Mahele, a Hawaiian thing. I'll jump to my metaphor after. The Mahele is a Hawaiian thing. What the reality we see today, 1893 overthrow. Even when it comes to land law. That flip in land law occurs after the overthrow. Could you speak louder for our listening audience? <laughs> <laughs> I will do my best, yes. So, the question that got me started in all of my research was, if the missionaries were in control since the time they arrived, 1820, then why did they have to overthrow themselves in 1893? That fundamental assumption right there, if you fundamentally believe the missionaries were in control, then why did they have to overthrow themselves? They were already in control. right? So that pulley, that shift in mindset right there, is what got me started in examining what, my, what baggage, what assumptions, what underlying ideas I carry into how I see and perspective through which I interpret things. Give a quick background on societal structure, right? Hawaii, very hierarchical. If uh, <clears throat> Ali'i with a kapu came in and their shadow fell on me, mocking, died, death. Right? We don't have that layer of hierarchy today, right? Today in America, everybody's created equal. Right? In our society, hierarchical, class, monarchy, right? Very, very different mindset. Very, very different thing going on there. So in the Hawaiian society, we had the Mo'i, the chief of chiefs, the elite class, and the Makai Nana. Yeah? And you had your kahuna, but very hierarchical, structural society, Akua at the top, of course, and all of those relationships in between. <clears throat> The Aupua system, 
island, broken up into districts, broken up into Wahupua, broken up into smaller land divisions, smaller land divisions, smaller land divisions. Division. Everything had a name. Yeah. The area between the low water mark and the vegetation, three, four, five different names. Today we go to the beach. Right? Our ancestors, observation, 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 observation. And that's what I implore us, this generation needs to do, is learn to observe again and get back that gradation. Because it's that gradation which is where our history is. <clears throat> when you put these two systems together, the Mo'i of an island would give up his lands to a Ali'i of a district. That Ali'i of a district would give it to his guys. If you wanted land in traditional times, the medium of exchange was allegiance. I pledge allegiance to a chief, that chief gives me land in return. Yeah. Today we want, we want land, the medium is money. I just gotta exchange 50% of my pay paycheck for 30 years of my life, <laughs> right? That's all. Back in this time, land in exchange for service. The Mahele is like Iolani Palace. Yeah. The what? Private property. Yes, Western. You look at the guts, you look at the interior, Hawaiian. You look at Iolani Palace, does that look like a Hawaiian hale to you from the outside? No. The exterior, Stacy Kamahiro writes an excellent article talking about how the architecture of the exterior of Iolani Palace is meant to satisfy a particular audience. That audience, the international arena, right? Looks very palace-like, very regal, very European in a lot of ways. You go inside of the palace, what does it have? Kalo motifs, kukui motifs, ko stairs. All of the symbology inside is Hawaiian. So we've all heard the metaphors, the apple, the coconut, red on the outside, white on the inside. You've assimilated into American culture. You're white on the inside. Yeah? Kamahiro reverses that. Iolani Palace, brown on the inside, white on the outside. Exterior, satisfy the international realm. Interior, domestic, Hawaii. Yeah? And that's my contention of what the Maheli is. Out exterior, private property, Western. Not trying to say that's a Hawaiian thing. The guts, the how we transition to private property, Hawaii. No other place in the world. There's, you go to America and we don't have a property system like any state in America. Totally different, totally unique. How is that the case if we were mimicking the missionaries from Boston? Yeah. Totally unique. You go buy a house today, your land title report will go back to the block, not to a township and range. You're not going to the southeast corner of the southwest corner of this township of this range, public land survey system. Yeah. It's going to an Ahupua in a district on an island. Very different. Chief, you guys have seen this slide before. Not a trick question. What does Mahale mean? To divide. Yeah. So what's being divided? The common response is land. We're talking about Hawaii's transition to private property in 1848. And when I ask this question, the common response is land. They divided the land in 1848. For the rest of this presentation, I'd like you to suspend that and see this through the perspective of dividing rights in land. Yeah. By dividing rights, people got land. If we're looking at the division of land, then we're putting the cart before the horse. Who had rights that got you land in the first place? Because that's what was being divided out. <clears throat> if we're dividing rights in land, who has rights in land? Let's see what the Constitution says. The origin of the present government and system of polity is as follows. <clears throat> Kamehameha I was the founder of the kingdom, and to him belonged all the land from one end of the islands to the other. Yeah. Land. Different context you can see land in. Yeah. Land, territory of a country, land, real property. You own land, 
that real property, you're still subject to property tax. You're still subject to zoning laws. You're still subject to, you don't own your land free and clear of the sovereignty of the state. Okay? So land, territory of a country, land, real property. Though it was not his own private property, it belonged to the chiefs and people in common, of whom Commandment the I was the head and had the management of the landed property. This is where Hawaii is totally unique and different. Yeah. If we're in France, all of the, the sovereignty, the land, belongs to the king of France. The real property belongs to the king of France. In Hawaii, all the land, the sovereignty, belong to Kana'i Commandment the First. Unification, no doubt, He's sovereign. Yeah. Though it was not his own private property, it belonged to the chiefs and people in common. The real property of Hawaii belonged to not just the king exclusively, but the people's rights in property was acknowledged from the beginning. Yeah, totally different, totally unique. When they were looking for <clears throat> examples of this, the discussion they had was not America, was not Britain, was not any of these countries. The closest entity that came to doing something that Hawaii did like this was Prussia. And maybe Nick Laos, after the conversation, can clue us in on, on, on that exchange wow. there. Yeah. But Prussia was an example. If we're trying to mimic Boston, why are they talking Prussia? What's that have to do with America? What does that have to do with the transition? We're not mimicking Boston. They're trying to take a Western system and put it in Hawaiian terms. <clears throat> Refinement of this idea. It being therefore fully established that there are but three classes of persons having vested rights in the land. First the government, second the landlord, and third the native tenant. It was not his own private property, his own, the king, representative of government. It belonged to the chiefs, the landlords, and the people in common, the tenants. So here we have constitutional law. I have the right to bear arms. Does that mean I can walk around with an AK-47? No. Yeah. <laughs> Depends what state, exactly. But that gets refined by statutory law, right? So you have constitutional law, the broad idea. What does this mean that it was not his own private property, it belonged to the chiefs and people in common? What's that saying? Right, broad, general, I have the right to bear arms. Those ideas get refined. Statutory law, 1846 principles of the land commission become statutory law. Yeah. Very powerful statement <clears throat> in here for the people who are into the nitty gritty of land title. There are but three classes of persons <coughs> having vested rights in the land. Vested right is a right that cannot be taken away from you that only you yourself can give up. It cannot be taken away from you, only you yourself can give up that right. We'll come back to this, because it's saying, hey, this thing here, this old though it was not his own private property thing, is a vested right. Did any of you give up that right? Mm -hmm. No. No? <clears throat> so who has rights in land? First the government, second the chiefs, third the native tenants. Where is this articulated? I don't know, I saw Donovan as he told me in at his presentation. How do we know that the government, the chiefs, and the people have rights in land? Yes. 1840 Constitution, 1846 Principles of the Land Commission. Very important for me that you guys understand the source, because this kind of be a old Donovan set. Yeah, because it's bigger than Donovan. You have to understand where, does, where do these ideas come from. <clears throat> the rest of this presentation is an explanation of how these undivided rights in land were divided. Undivided rights conceptually means we all, <clears throat> if these chairs in this room are house lots or acres, we all have a... We, if we all have, everyone in this room has an undivided rights to the property, to the chairs in this room, then we all can sit anywhere. Yeah? 
this chair isn't my chair and that chair isn't Lynette's chair. We all have a right to every single chair. We have a right to a chair. We have a right to sit in this house. Yeah. When you divide your rights, when you partition your three acre parcel that mom and dad inherited to you with your <coughs> brothers and sisters, and you divide up the rights and you say, this chair, <coughs> this acre is mine, not my brother and sisters. My brother and sister's property is theirs, not mine, not our other brother and sister. That division, that partition, is the division of rights. And that's what they're doing. Because right now, three classes, not people, three classes of people. The chiefs have an undivided interest. The people have an undivided interest. And the government has an undivided interest. Yeah. <clears throat> to further complicate things, this is all Prior to 1840, we do not have the concept of government as distinguished from the monarch in Hawaii. The Mahal of 1848 is in 1848. Hawaii get transitions from an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy in 1840. That's eight years prior. So eight years prior to dividing up the land, they also created this concept of government that is separate from the person of the king. When you're the absolute monarch, you are everything, what you say goes. When you're the constitutional monarch, you now have the executive, legislative, judicial. The king represents the executive, gave up through the constitution his power for the judiciary and for these other powers. Yeah, so now you have government. So who's the king? Is the king government or is the king Korahiki? Well, he's both, it depends what hat he's wearing on that particular time. <clears throat> the most misunderstood part of the Mahale is the role of the Land Commission. <clears throat> the confusion from the Mahale comes from approach. You can approach the Mahale from land title or you can approach the Mahale from procedure. Procedure, do step one, do step two. Do step three, do step four, do step five. Put in your claim, get your survey, get your land commission award, get your royal patent. Yeah? Do these steps, you get land. The other approach, which is the approach I'm <coughs> sharing with you here, is well, if, <coughs> if what we're ultimately doing in 1848 is creating fee central <coughs> property, who has the fee? At what stage in the process do you have the fee symbol? And those two different approaches, fundamentally, one can explain why. Why do I need to do step three? Just do it. Yeah, this is like little kid days. Do this, why? Just do it. Shut up, mom said, tutu said. Right, we all know that one well. Tutu said, the land commission said, Chinen said, why? I don't know. Tutu said, we don't question. Don't question tutu, right? But if you follow the title, you can get a very, very different explanation. The Land Commission can be broken up into three different <clears throat> categories. The first category we're going to look at is oral gifts. Uh, for a long time, this was a question mark, and I would always make the joke that hopefully someone in this room can spend two years of their life turning that question mark into a number. Yeah? One of my former students and a former student of uh, Kamana Beamers is actually taking that up for his master's thesis. And so we have someone who's going to give us that number in two years. Yeah. Right now we don't know. Oral gifts <coughs> are people who are participating outside of the traditional system. So when a ship captain came to Hawaii and said, hey chief, I'd like some land, that chief gave him some land. That was an oral gift. Why oral? Because there was no writing before 1820. So in 1790, the king orally gifted this person land. What did the chief give that person? That's what the land commission is investigating in 1836. <coughs> what were these oral gifts given to these various people who are not showing up for Po'alima on Fridays to trade service for land as everybody else in the traditional system was? These people were engaged in a new system, leases. Yeah. So leasing was prevalent 
since the time of the coming of foreigners. Yeah, we already had the concept of leasing in the 1780s, 1790s, 1800s, 1810. The Mahele is known both as an event and a process. The event occurs over two months, yeah, January three months, January to March. Yeah, that's the Mahele event, even though it's a three month process. During this event, Kawi Keoli and the 252 chiefs divide the four million, approximate 4 million acres of Hawaii between themselves. The Mahele of 1848 divided out the rights of the chiefly class. There are but three classes of persons having vested rights in land. First, the government. Second, the chiefs. The first step in the Mahele process was dividing out the rights of chiefs. The Mahele of 1848 divided out the rights of all of the chiefs in all of the land. So you still have the rights of government and the rights of native tenants in these lands, and you still have the rights of government and the rights of native tenants in these lands. They haven't been maheled out yet. Now we can't divide three things at the same time. We've got to peel one layer, peel the next layer, peel the next layer. First layer of division between the chiefs. Traditional times, Kalai Aina, the first thing the chiefs would do, come into the Hale Nawa, chant 10 generations of genealogy on each side. After chanting 10 generations, of, that gets you entry, that doesn't get you land, that gets you entry to participate in the process, and then the chiefs would divide the land. The chiefs are dividing the land. Yeah? For me, not very far conceptually from traditional Kalai Aina. Yeah? The chiefs got in a row, divided the land. Exactly what's going on here. At this stage, by first dividing the rights of the chiefs, the chiefs, the chiefs got land. Okay. So divide the rights, then they got land. They were in possession after of that. The day after the Mahele, Kawi Keoli takes his two and a half million acres and divides his land between his two hats. He's a chief, the highest ranking chief, and he's the head of government, the executive department. When Kawi Keoli, and notice I use Kawi Keoli here and not Kamehameha III, because Kamehameha III is the president of the United States, is the title of the office. Kawi Keoli is the name of the chief. Barack Obama is a person, the president <coughs> of the United States, is a title of an office. Kawi Keoli is the highest ranking chief. He's not participating as representative of government, he's participating as a chief. Day after the Mahele, he takes his two and a half million acres of land, divides it between the government and his personal property. The motivation for the Mahele at this time was <clears throat> the fact that in international law, Private property was respected in the event of conquest. So Kawi Keoli in Privy Council, he's getting all of these books. Blackstone's Commentaries, Kent's uh, American Law. He has all of these authorities in international law. They mention them in Privy Council. Yeah? They have copies. They literally have copies of these books here. In those books, talking about <coughs> private property, being respected in the event of takeover. What's happening in 1840? The British. <laughs> <laughs> the British in New Zealand, right? You have the colonization of Tahiti in 1842. You have colonization of New Caledonia. You have all of this colonization going on in the Pacific, and letters are coming back from Queen Kumari and from all of these other leaders back and forth. <coughs> His response to colonization, to imperialism, was to protect the rights of the people through the creation of private property. If an invading country came into Hawaii in 1840 and took over the king, all four million acres of land belongs to that invading country. Because there's no private property. So then his people, would have then had to go to the colonizer and say, hey, can, we get, can, can I get an acre? So to preempt that, in Privy Council, they're talking about 
His, one of his main motivations is that threat of imperialism. So was the Mahal a foreign influence in that regard? Yes. He was definitely responding to imperialism. What he was also responding to was depopulation. Population at the time of Cook, 400,000, 800,000, depending on whose estimate you want to take. Let's go with the low. Population at Discovery, 1778, 400,000. Population in 1850, two years after the Mahale, 80,000. 480. <coughs> One fifth the population is alive. Yeah. One fifth of the population is alive. We may have got to see what that looked like today if that was real, <laughs> right? But one fifth of the we, we this generation that wasn't alive during World War II does not understand the loss of a million people. The biggest, the biggest atrocity during my lifetime was the 100,000 people that died from the tsunami in Indonesia, right? One fifth, between 1850 and 1890, 80,000 to 40,000, another half. In my lifetime, half the population died between 1850 and 1890. Yeah. So the second response is to depopulation. Now, if you ask me the tough question of if there wasn't depopulation, would Kamehameha III still have done the Mahele? That one, I don't know. But he was responding to the problem that the lands were unproductive. The lands weren't unproductive because Hawaiians are lazy. The lands were unproductive because there was one-fifth less the population from the time of discovery because of disease. Yeah. So those two things driving, we need to make the lands productive again. What we're doing, what we've been doing since 1778, is not working. If you throw a wrinkle into that and you look at all of the port towns, if there's 80,000 people and there's five, so for easy math, let's say there's 1,000 on the wall. There's more, there's 2,000, but I want the easy math. Easy math, 1,000 Ahuwa, 40, 400,000 people, 1,000 Ahuwa, 400 people per Ahuwa on average. If there's 4,000 people in Hilo, where do those 4,000 people come from? <coughs> there's 3,600 people from other Ahuwa that now have to fill that void, which means you have vacant land everywhere. Yeah? Because people are going to the port towns, they're going to Lahaina, they're going to Hilo, they're going to Honolulu, they're leaving Eva. When smallpox comes to Eva, we don't stay in Eva. We get out of Dodge because we once had 400 people to maintain the Awai. Now there's 80 of us. So now 80 people got to do the work of 400. The Ahupua system was collapsing, right? It's labor intensive. You need the people, you need the work. The people weren't on the land. Day after the Mahale, King divides his lands. <clears throat> this is George Bush's ranch in Texas. This is the White House. The lands that, the proceeds, money, income, benefit of all the people. Proceeds, money, that's how he always. It's his personal private property. Crown lands are a very interesting topic because they become an anomaly um, that we can talk about a little bit later. But this is that separation. Government, king, the king's private property. George Bush's ranch in Texas, the White House. Do, we have, does, do the American people have a claim to George Bush's ranch in Texas? No. Yeah. Same thing here. The white people don't have a claim to the king's private land. These were his private lands, right? with layers that are too complicated for this topic when you get into the idea of vested rights in that. Yeah? But <clears throat> surface level distinction there. <coughs> the 252 Konohiki, they're one and a half million acres. They don't own this land in fee simple. They have a lesser form of title, and that lesser form of title is a life estate. Traditional days, when these Konohiki got land, what did they get? A life estate. 
that life estate wasn't called a life estate, but what a life estate is, is a lease, a lease for the duration of a person's life. Conceptually, at this point, they have what they would have had traditionally. If I got land tr in traditional times from one of the chiefs, I had it for the duration that that chief was alive. And when that chief died, it went to the chief and went back. It's a life estate. We have not deviated yet from tradition. This is still their holding land in how they would have held land in traditional times. This introduces a uh, Another term, commutation. Commutation by definition means exchange. This commutation was one of the steps, one of the processes in the Mahele process. So after 1855, these 252 chiefs, a bunch of them got together, and at this time you could either pay one third the value of the land in cash, or you could pay, give back one third of the land. So what these chiefs did was Give back one third of the lands. So this approximately 1.5 million acres. Commutation gets paid. At this point, these 252 chiefs now own this land in fee simple private property. And we'll go over the hows and the whys in a second. But then they gave back 500,000 acres. <coughs> So the government now has the 1.5 million and the 500,000 acres. Government has 200 to 2 million acres, 50% of all of the lands in Hawaii. I got it off. So here's the results of the Mahalis. Yeah, the king gets a million acres, the government gets 2 million acres, the chiefs get a million acres. We don't know how many hundreds or tens of thousands of oral gifts. There's 300, and uh, he told me the number, there's 320 something, 300 something oral gifts. Um, but he didn't add the acreages yet. An example of these oral gifts is, if any of you are from Waianae side, Ohikilolo. Ohikilolo Ahupua, Keao Beach Park. Keao Beach Park, the next Ahupua is Ohikilolo. Looks dry today, that's probably due to some military water diversion in the 1900s. <coughs> um, but Ohikilolo was an example of one of those oral gifts. And Kuleana lands, 28,000 acres of Kuleana lands. So this is the normal summary, and it's this number here that is normally used to say, A, greedy king, greedy government, greedy chiefs, the people didn't get land. Yeah, that 28,000 acres, if you divide 28,000 divided by 4 million, it's less than 1%, it's 0.01%, it's not even a percent of a 1%. Yeah. So this statistic has been used to frame the Mahele is the worst thing that happened to the whole People didn't get land. Yeah. Greedy chief, greedy king, greedy upper echelon of society, right? And uh, this comes from the 70s and 80s when Marxism and class distinction was the topic of the day. <coughs> Sorry. I'm not gonna sit. give up their right to that, all get 50 acres each, and 
Now, the Isla Ohana has nine brothers and sisters with 50 acres in time. So did the Isla get on land? Yes. Is that in this 20,000 <coughs> acre statistic? No. So this is where you have to pay attention. The, one of the ironies, one of the questions I always ask is, all the Hawaiians in the room, how many of us have a story of loss of land? Everybody's hand goes up. You cannot have a story of loss of land because this statistic tells me Hawaiians did not get land. If we didn't get land, we cannot have stories of loss of land. So something has to give. Either the story is wrong, Hawaiians didn't get land, or you're wrong and you didn't lose land. You never had land in the first place. And I don't want to say anything you're wrong. I don't think so. The story is wrong. The story needs to be adjusted. Hawaiians didn't get land via this mechanism, but they got land via other mechanisms. Which is why we all have a story of loss of land. Because we did that has to be. But I don't want to. I have a question. You know that Puliana land has a gift. Does um, it keep the gift continue to generation, or does it end that? Um, I'll get to the more complicated part of that, but in this system, yeah, it's actually this has to move and then it's about face the other way. Damn, it's hard. We today do not can don't have a claim to one thing we need to go back. Tutu sold legitimately. I'm not talking plantation guy came in and that kind of stuff. Tutu said, hey, we need money. She sold it. She sold it. Fee simple is fee simple. You sell a piece of land today, you sold it. But there are so many stories of plantation this, plantation that coming in and fraud. I'm not talking about fraud. I'm talking about just straight up, legit, Tutu sold, Tutu sold. And that's the part the Hawaiians are going to have to try to reconcile. If Tutu sold, Tutu sold. 